What a joy to be here to talk about doxology and theology, to talk about worship, and I have the great honor. As you are thinking about worship, specifically in light of the 500th anniversary of the, of the Reformation, what an honor I have to speak to you this evening about doxology and theology in the sense of worship and sola scriptura. I'm really glad to be in the company of those who understand that this is not an unnatural conversation. Uh, there are some people who would talk about worship and they would know they're supposed to say something about scripture, but they don't know what to say. I'm thankful to be in the company of those who are a scriptured people. But how good is it necessary for us from time to time to remind ourselves of what that means and what that looks like? I want to invite you to turn with me in scripture and we're going to look at the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 1 through 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law as Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing a square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood... Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masaiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his right hand, his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Joshua, Bani, Sarabiah, Jamin, Akub, Sabbathai, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelaiah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Roger Scruton, very well-known British philosopher, who is now, by his own confession, a Christian believer, but who was not a believer when he wrote the statement I'm going to share with you, was trying to explain God as a philosophical concept to a secular audience. And he made the interesting point that if you want to understand philosophically, phenomenologically, if you want to understand what people believe, he said, you can certainly turn to their theologians and you could read from their books, but he said, as a philosopher, I have discovered that if you really want to know what people believe, listen to them worship. He said, because regardless of what they say they believe, regardless of perhaps even what they think they believe, what they actually believe is what they do in worship. Most specifically, by the way, and very revealingly, Roger Scruton said that the most insightful revelation about belief comes not merely from watching people to worship, but in particular to listen to them as they pray and as they sing. Let's think about that for a moment, as, as they pray and as they sing. You know, that's a pretty severe indictment in terms of a lot of what passes for prayer, especially in evangelical circles where there's, there's so, so much superficiality and so often just a, a resort to formula. When I was 14 years old, my father told me that I was going to start working in his grocery store, which I thought was a great thing. I was all excited about this. And I discovered that I really didn't understand a work ethic yet, but I was about to big time. Uh, in, in the store, I was at the lowest ranks. I was a bag boy, 
and to put groceries in a bag. And then we had to take the groceries out and we put them in the car. And almost always back then, it was a trunk of a car. And always, it was generally a woman who was the customer. So I was very accustomed to taking the groceries out, putting them in the trunk, and then I was to close the trunk and I was to turn to the customer and say, thank you for shopping at and give the name of the store. And say, we hope you come back soon. Thank you for shopping with us. We hope you'll come back soon. Thank you for shopping with us. We hope you'll come back soon. You do that several hundred times a day and it's like a tattoo on the back of your eyelids. <laughs> thank you for shopping with us today. We hope you come back soon. At the same time, I was the oldest child of four, and, and there was a tremendous distance between the first two and the second two. And so when I was 14, we had toddlers and a, and a baby in the house, and I, uh, they were being taught how to pray the blessing, the, the toddler was, and, uh, at, at the table. And, and the prayer they were being taught was, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. God is great, God is good. Not a word of heresy in there, by the way. It's all right. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Oldest child, it was my job to pray that prayer so that little brothers could see me and learn accordingly. The problem was when the wires got crossed. I took the groceries out for this lady, put them in the car, closed the trunk, looked at her with a straight face and with no sign of particular religious inspiration and simply said, God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. <laughs> and uh, you know, I just got this strange look from this lady and I realized that this is back during the time of the Moonies and the Hare Krishna and all the rest. And she's thinking, I got a 15 year old religious fanatic on my hands here. I don't know exactly. And she said something like, yes, let's or something and <laughs> got her into her car and, and drove away. And. Uh, you know, in, in my teenage self, I did have the realization, how much can this mean if I get my wires crossed? Evidently, this prayer did not mean much more to me than thank you for shopping with us today. I hope you'll come back soon. And then one of the things we recognize is that if a philosopher who is an unbeliever were listening into much of our prayer, he or she would not gain a great deal of insight about any theological depth on the part of many evangelicals, including at worship. It's also really interesting when we think about what we sing to understand that if a phenomenologist or a philosopher or an anthropologist were coming to try to find out what we believe and came to our worship service, in much of what is called evangelicalism, there would be almost no theology to report. It makes me particularly happy to be with you. As we're thinking about the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we recognize that it's not just a date on a calendar. It's arbitrary to go back to October 31, 1517, but not entirely arbitrary because something did happen that day when an Augustinian monk took those 95 theses and nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. And that was at least the first public act in a continuous stream of what we refer to as the Reformation, and there we find our own story. We ground our own understanding of the gospel as we teach it and we preach it on our churches as we know them in that day. Now, that does not mean any more than the Reformers meant that there was no church before October the 31st of 1517. But it did mean that from that point onward, the gospel having been defined, was set loose. And the huge question was, where is the true church? And how is the true church rightly ordered? And what does the true church actually believe? The reformers came to an understanding that where you find the true church, you will find right worship. And where you find right worship, you have found the true church. Martin Luther, as the course of the Reformation went forward, when he had to define the marks of the true church, and remember, those marks were not merely a way of trying to check off a list. Those marks were the question as to whether or not this is a church or not. Is this the church? of which Jesus Christ said, the gates of hell shall not prevail, or is it a false church that is preaching a false gospel? Luther said the very first mark is what happens or doesn't happen in worship, which is the preaching of the word of God, where the word of God is rightly preached. And the second mark that Luther offered was also tied to worship. He said where the sacraments are rightly administered, 
where we would we say the, the ordinances are rightly obeyed. You'll notice that Luther, in trying to define where the true church is, went first and most essentially to worship. How did he know to do that? When we talk about sola scriptura, we make reference to the, the formal principle of the Reformation. We make a distinction between the formal principle of the Reformation, sola scriptura, and the material principle of the Reformation, which is sola fide. You can't have the Reformation without sola fide, for that matter. We don't believe you can have the gospel without sola fide. But you don't really know what the gospel is as sola fide unless you understand that this is by divine revelation and God's gracious gift in the scripture, thus sola scriptura. Why did this become such a crucial issue? Well, here's some very important clarifications are necessary. The Roman Catholic Church did not believe that the Scripture was anything other than the Word of God. Sometimes Protestants, in telling the story of the Protestant Reformation, slander the Roman Catholic Church in this sense by saying things that are abjectly false. The, the Roman Catholic Church did not believe that the Bible was anything other than the Word of God. And the Roman Catholic Church, including its supreme pontiff, the Pope, would have been very clear that Scripture is authoritative. The five solas as we know them, Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, are actually a 20th century invention as formulas. We speak rightly of the five solas, but that was a 20th century attempt to summarize the historic teaching of the Reformation, the theological achievement of the Reformers, and, and every one of them is legitimate because every one of them played a crucial role. And every one of them was affirmed by the reformers. Luther himself, speaking of the material principle of the Reformation, justification by faith alone, went so far as to say that it is the article by which the church stands or falls. And again, the Roman Catholic Church would have been very clear to have affirmed that salvation is by faith. The Roman Catholic Church did this during the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church did this at the Council of Trent in the generation after the Reformers. They affirmed that justification is by faith and salvation is God's gift. The current Roman Catholic Pope will be very clear in affirming the fact that, that we are justified by faith and that salvation is entirely God's gift. So why was there a Reformation? It's because of the reformer's insistence on the word alone. It's scripture alone as the final authority. It's justification by faith alone. By grace alone. On the merits of Christ alone to the glory of God alone. The reformers would never have gotten in trouble without the word alone, sola, sola. It's, it's sola that created the problem. And remember that this wasn't just a political problem. This wasn't just some kind of abstract theological debate. This was a matter of life and it was a matter of death. It's hard for many people today in kind of this post-Christian theologically anemic age to believe that theology could be a matter of life and death, but it certainly was. And of course, in a way that we fully understand now it still is. There were huge questions. Here's one of the key questions. Is there one source of revelation or are there two? This is really, really crucial. Is there one source of revelation or are there two? The Roman Catholic Church believed that the scripture was God's revelation, but they also believed that the church itself was a vessel of revelation. It was a source of revelation. Thus, even though the Roman Catholic Church recognized the Scripture as God's revelation, and, and even as in the, the, the process of recognizing the canon, identified what we recognize as the Old Testament and the New in the 66 books, and, and even though the Roman Catholic Church confessionally and creedally and quite authentically affirmed the fact that Scripture was a source of revelation, they also held that the church itself was a source of revelation. They would look back to Matthew chapter 16 and say that when Jesus established the church, 
According to their understanding and the official teaching of the church, he handed the keys to Peter. And, and the, those keys represent an independent source of revelation. That's absolutely crucial because if there are two sources of revelation, then the scripture is necessarily accompanied by some other source. And if there's another source of revelation, it comes after scripture. And if it comes subsequent to scripture, it is adding to or correcting necessarily what is found in scripture. Martin Luther was faced with some huge questions. And, and most of his questions, first and foremost, had to do with what began the 95 Theses. If you look at the actual 95 Theses, just about everyone knows there were 95 of them and very few Protestants know what any one of them was. But, but the very first of his Theses had to do with the corruption of the sacrament of penance. This, this was really huge because Luther detected from Scripture that there was a shift from repentance to penance. And, and, and there was a shift from the merits of Christ alone to the treasury of the merits of the saints. And Luther's trying to figure out where this comes from because it is not coming from Scripture. And of course, he's looking at the abuses with Johannes Tetzel going around selling indulgences based upon this very same understanding of penance. And the sacerdotal authority that was invested in the priesthood. And Martin Luther's reading the scripture. He is at this point a professor of theology, a professor of scripture, and he is fully aware that there is none of this in scripture. So what's the theological authority by which it is claimed that it is rightful for the church to offer indulgences or to demand obedience to the sacrament of penance or to invest in the priesthood, a sacerdotal authority to forgive sin? And, and that's where Luther came to understand, well, it's because the Roman Catholic Church is claiming that the church itself is also a vessel of revelation. Scriptura would not have gotten the reformers into trouble. It's sola scriptura. The first question was, are, are there two sources of revelation or one? And the second is, what is the nature then of Scripture? So is it enough to say that Scripture is revelation? Is it enough to say that Scripture is inspired? Is it enough to say that Scripture is without error? Is it enough to say that Scripture is authoritative? Luther began to understand the problem. And this, this is in the white hot heat of trying to deal with the question of what the gospel is, which Luther isn't concerned about just as a professor of theology. He's concerned about as a sinner. He's concerned about this as an individual sinner. This is the same Luther who said of his time as an Augustinian monk. He said, if ever there were a monk who could have been saved by his monkery, it was I. This was one of the most serious monks you've ever seen in your life. He was absolutely fanatical about his monastic vows. He was absolutely fanatical about his responsibility as a monk. As he said, if monkery could have saved me, I would have been saved. Some of you know that he had a confessor by the name of Johannes von Stalpitz. He was evidently a very indulgent, kindly man, a, a, a man who was in many ways, we now understand, a friend of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And von Stalpitz was the confessor to whom Luther had to come. Luther was completely convinced of his sinfulness. As a matter of fact, that's Luther's great personal problem. He understands his own sinfulness and he despairs that he can ever be declared righteous by God because all of his efforts by his monkery and everything else to, to, to earn and to demonstrate a, a righteousness and a worthiness of salvation, he knows they amount to nothing. That's Luther's problem. He understands himself perfectly. And it's Luther who, not reading a theological treatise, but reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17 and that famous experience in the tower comes to understand that the just shall live by his faith. And Luther then said, it was as if the very windows of heaven were open to me. And that's when we are told that for in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to, it, to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by his faith. That's when Luther understands 
that there is no righteousness in him whatsoever, as Paul made very clear, and that the only righteousness that saves is a perfect righteousness, and the only perfect righteousness is Christ. But by the atonement, by God's mercy that was accomplished in the sinless life and in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, by justification, by faith alone, by grace alone, on the merits of Christ alone, the righteousness of Christ himself is imputed to the sinner. So that the Father now sees not our sin, but the righteousness of Christ. And here's the problem. Luther found that in Scripture, but it was denied by the teaching of the church. The 95 Theses were not a declaration of independence. This, this wasn't like a bunch of revolutionaries that were attaching their signatures to the bottom of a statement and sending it to King George. Luther didn't intend to launch a revolution. He wanted to launch a reform. He honestly thought, as, as unusual as this may sound, he, he honestly thought that if he were convincing enough in terms of making this argument that the Pope in Rome would hear of it and would read his arguments and would go, that young man's exactly right. We've got to reform the church. And we also have to understand that calls for reformation were already being heard thundering throughout Christendom. But they had come to nothing. Luther ended up establishing and, and leading a reformation, but what he wanted first was merely reform. Calvin would later come and explain it this way. He would say that the problem is that reform never happens unless the church is reformed by the word of God. And when the church was reformed by the word of God, it didn't end up merely with reform, it ended up with the reformation. The question of the nature of scripture led Luther and the other reformers to the conclusion that it was absolutely necessary to speak of the total truthfulness and the total trustworthiness of scripture. One source of authority, not two, one source of revelation, not two, and, and thus invested in Scripture because it is God's Word. Not merely because Scripture claims this of itself, which it does, and not merely because we have no other source of revelation, which is true, but because of God's own character, which He has revealed in this Scripture, if it is God's Word, then it is perfect. And if it is perfect, then the words that follow include words like infallible and inerrant. Now, again, the Roman Catholic Church would have affirmed that the Bible is infallible and inerrant. It still does today. The Roman Catholic Church still affirms that the Bible is infallible and the Bible is inerrant. But those words are followed by when rightly interpreted. And that interpretation is understood as the stewardship of the magisterium of the church, which they still claim is a second source of revelation. Luther came to understand that all of the wonderful things that had been said about Scripture by the church as he had known it, and the church of which he was a professor of theology at the time, that all the wonderful things that were said of Scripture were actually right, but not right enough. He also understood that everything that was rightfully and wonderfully said about Scripture was undermined by the claim that the church was a second source of revelation and the argument that the church could only be rightly interpreted by the magisterial authority. But Luther wasn't the first to see the problem. A hundred years before 1517, going back to 1408, especially the years 1414 to 1418, the Council of Constance was held. And, and when the Roman Catholic Church, a century before the Reformation, held the Council of Constance, at least part of the reason they held the, the council was because of, of calls for reform, urgent calls for reform. That's a practical problems too. First of all, they called the council because they had two rival popes. And, and by the time they got there, they had three rival popes. And it's no good having a pope if you got more than one. And so they had to settle that question. The other issue was, which is superior, popes or councils? And, and again, the, the councils of the church were understood to be the church and its authoritative magisterial teaching authority. But here's a chicken and egg question which only the Roman Catholics could entertain. And that is, which comes first, the Pope or the council? And, and that really is a chicken or egg question because only 
Only a pope can call a council, and only a council can elect a pope. Here's the other problem. The council will be called together, and at the Council of, of Constance, there in the beginning of the 15th century, they declared officially, councils are superior to popes. The problem is the council disbanded, went home, and the pope stayed. And so even though they said that the council is superior to the pope, in reality, the pope was far superior to the council because he was in Rome and they were not. Fast forward to the Diet of Worms, 1521, when Martin Luther is on trial for his life, standing before not only the inquisitor and the trial of the Roman Catholic Church, but also the Holy Roman Empire with the Holy Roman Emperor present. And this is when Luther is asked to answer for his teachings. And you recall what he says. He says, he said he took his stand on scripture. And you remember why he said, because popes and councils may err and contradict one another. He actually went back to the Council of Constance language from the, the century before. This is sort of like Jesus when he's confronted by the the Pharisees and the Sadducees as they're making a common cause against him and he divides the house by bringing up resurrection and angels because then, then they don't agree. Well, Luther in staring down the court is using language they would fully have understood. He said, oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, you not only have a Pope, you got councils and they don't always agree and sometimes they contradict. So much for your second source of authority in Revelation. So Luther said, I stand upon the scripture. He said, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason. And you look at it and you say, well, what's is that Luther, the enlightenment philosopher, convinced of the power and authority of revelation and rationality? No, the language Luther is using there means <laughs> the plain reading of scripture. Unless I'm convinced by scripture and plain reason, that is the plain understanding of scripture then he said, I cannot and I will not recant, for to go against conscience is not right nor safe. Then Luther said those famous words, here stay ich, ich kann nicht ander, Gottes help is mich. Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. God, God help me, I can't do anything else. Do we understand that sola scriptura is a statement of theological desperation? Sola Scripture is what we get to when we don't have any other place to go. And, and that's what Luther was confessing even as he was standing on trial for his life. He didn't say, you know, I've been looking at various theories of inspiration, revelation, and ecclesiology. And it seems to me that uh, the plain reading of Scripture and the, the authority of Scripture taken as it, it, its own final authority is superior. He said, I don't have any choice. I've got nowhere else to stand. And he threw it right back at them and said, am I supposed to stand with the Pope? Then which Pope? Am I supposed to stand with the councils? Then which council? Am I supposed to stand with the, council, the councils and the popes? They can't even agree with one another. Oh, and by the way, Scripture is the Word of God. It turns out that it's all I've got. And it turns out that it's all I need. There are a couple of things to understand here because uh, sometimes we as evangelicals get this right and simultaneously we get it wrong because we, we say it forcefully. We know to say the solas for, forcefully. Sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christus, sola dea gloria. We know how to say it forcefully, but do we understand what we mean when we're saying it? Sola scriptura does not mean scriptura nuda. I just woke somebody up. It doesn't mean scripture naked. Now, what did the reformers mean by that? They meant that we're never showing up without tradition. We're never showing up without people who have read the inerrant, infallible, totally true and trustworthy scripture before us. We're not the first readers of scripture. And that's why when you listen to Martin Luther, he will say, I'm not standing on the authority of the Pope. I'm not standing on the authority of the council. I'm standing on the authority of God's word alone. But then, as he makes his theological argument, he will say, as Augustine said. Now, how can he say that? It's because the Reformers didn't say, we're the first people to read Scripture. They didn't say, we have nothing to learn by those who've been reading the Scripture for centuries before us. They said, we test everything finally by Scripture. Scripture is the sole, final authority. If you read John Calvin, you'll discover the, the, the person cited most often other than a scriptural authority is Augustine, just like with Luther. 
And the second most common person that Calvin cites in his writings is Bernard of Calvo, something most evangelicals wouldn't think about. Both Luther and Calvin and the other reformers, they were, they were glad to say, we're standing with the faithful wherever they are found. We are standing with the gospel wherever it is found. We are standing with orthodox, biblical doctrine and teaching wherever it is found. But we test everything by the sole authority of Scripture. We don't know what the gospel is because of Augustine. You know what the gospel is because God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And because God gave us the word, and in the word alone, we find that final authority. Again, the issue of authority is really important here. And it's important not just in contrasting the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformation, but contrasting various understandings of what people will affirm as the authority of Scripture in the church today. It's hard to find anyone who will tell you, I don't believe Scripture has authority. It's, it's hard to find that person. Instead, what you find are persons who say, yes, we believe in the authority of Scripture, but when you ask them, what does that mean? They have no coherent answer. Or when they answer it, you discover it's, it, it's clearly not the authority of Scripture as a perfectly trustworthy and true revelation. Or it's the authority of Scripture so long as we rightly interpret it. One of the most dangerous formulas in, in this is what you see when someone says, well, I know that's what it says, but let me tell you what it means. And there'll be people who say, yeah, I believe in the authority of Scripture, but uh, that's a really tough text. Let me tell you what it really means, what it must mean. Let's hope to God it means. That, that, that's not the authority of Scripture the Reformers came to understand in the white-hot heat of controversy in which the stakes were life and death, not only temporally, but eternally. They came to understand that the authority of Scripture means the final authority of Scripture. Luther's word for it is a phrase, actually. It's in the Latin, and it's, it's somebody, needs to, somebody here has the talent to put this to music. I don't know. It just seems to me it would work. It's Latin, norma, normans, non, normata. may end up sounding like a Hindu chant, so maybe that's not a great idea. But <laughs> anyway, norma, normans, non, normata. Norma, normans, non, normata. In the, Luther, in the Latin, what Luther was saying was, Scripture is the norm of norms that can't be normed. You got to love that. It's the norm of all norms. And as the norm of all norms, it cannot be normed. Nothing norms Scripture. Scripture norms everything. So what does this have to do with worship? Everything. What are the implications for worship? What difference would sola scriptura make? Well, the first implication would be the regulative principle. The, the, the first implication would be the norming of all things by Scripture, and the first thing that must be normed is right worship. Wherever you find right worship, you find the church. Wherever you find the church, you find right worship. Where there is no right worship, there is no church. Where you find right worship, it's going to be normed by Scripture. That's the first implication of sola scriptura. The second implication is the centrality of preaching in worship. That's just made abundantly clear. It's, it's made abundantly clear in the text I read from Nehemiah chapter 8. And you say, well, that's the Old Testament. You're pointing to the Old Covenant. And yes, I am. You're pointing to the book of the law. Yes, I know. But the point is that you will find consistently throughout Scripture, through the development of a cohesive biblical theology, that where you find God's people at worship, where you find God's people attentive to him, you find God's people listening to his word. And the simplicity of what's described in Nehemiah chapter 8 is just pristine. It's wonderful. They stood in a wooden box that had been built for the purpose. And Ezra and his colleagues opened the book and they read from it plainly in the presence of the men and women who were gathered and those who were able to understand. That means, that means children who are, it's kind of like they, they, the rest of them were in children's church. Uh, the ones who weren't yet ready to understand. But the, the, those who were of age and who could understand, they all gathered and, and they listened as Ezra and his fellow scribes read from the book plainly and then explained the meaning. That's the best definition of preaching found anywhere in Scripture. 
You stand up in front of people, open God's word, say, this is God's word. You read it plainly so that it can be understood. And then you say, here's what it says. You explain its meaning. Now, by the time we understand all that is revealed in scripture about worship, there's more than preaching. But rightly understood, the course of a rightly ordered worship will recapitulate the entire gospel of Jesus Christ. It will be saturated in doxology from beginning to end. And it will understand that the hearing and the preaching of the word of God are the central acts of worship. Everything leading up to it and necessarily following. The third implication is this. If preaching is indeed central to Christian worship, rightly ordered by scripture, then the only preaching that will do is a scriptural preaching. I would dare to say an expository preaching. What is described in Nehemiah, what Ezra was doing. And, and there, there's no better definition of exposition than reading the text plainly so that people can hear what you're saying and what you're reading and then explaining what it is. That's all the biblical exposition is. That's not to reduce the skill and the discipline and the study that is necessary for it. It's simply to say it's not all that complicated. I was speaking on this to a group of preachers not long ago, and I, I mentioned to them something that I'd heard someone make reference to in terms of instructions that are found. And I, I heard someone say, you know, the instructions on the shampoo I saw in the shower need to have one additional point. It says, lather, rinse, repeat. And he said, they should have said, and then stop. And dry off and get out of the shower. He said, because taken literally, you just lather and rinse and repeat and lather and rinse and repeat and lather and rinse. If you're a literalist, that's all you got. You can obey the instructions. That's what you're doing. But you know what struck me was that's what preachers need to think. And you don't need to add anything afterwards. Just read the text and explain it and repeat read the text and explain it and repeat and read the text and explain it. And the problem is there are a lot of people who think preaching is something different than that or other than that. And there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, that doesn't tend to produce many short-term results, which is entirely true. The most horrifying thing for the preacher is that the congregation goes out frighteningly like they came in. And uh, even over some amount of time, I mean, you, you know people and you're preaching to them, you understand whatever's happening is slow and subtle. And there's a little forward and then there's a little backward and there's a little forward and there's a little backward. That's called the doctrine of sanctification. And you know, here's the thing. The preacher doesn't get to say, that didn't look too good this week. We're going to come up with plan B. There's only plan A. And, and that's because as Luther so well understood and what is behind that affirmation of scripture as, as the sole authority and behind sola scriptura is something that even many evangelicals don't understand. And that is the reformers absolute conviction is revealed in scripture that the word of God is never alone by the time it reaches the human heart because only the Holy Spirit can take the word of God there. Luther's instructions to his students are so helpful when he said, it is your job to get the word of, the word of God from your lips to their ears and you can go no further. But you have the absolute confidence that the Holy Spirit who inspired this word and ensures that it is a living and active word, sharper than any two-edged sword, that word will be able to do what you cannot do because the Holy Spirit takes that word beyond your preaching and implants it in the hearts of God's people and brings about regeneration and brings about in the life of the believer, sanctification. The last implication in terms of what I'm thinking here is that sola scriptura means that worship must be ordered by the word of God. Again, that regulative principle, every part of it ordered by the word of God. But that raises some hard questions. First of all, what exactly does this mean? What, what would, I, I, just like it's hard to find someone who says, I really don't believe in the authority of Scripture. It's hard to find someone who says, no, I don't believe in worship ordered by the Word of God. Yeah. 
The question is, what do you believe about the authority of Scripture? And how do you believe that worship is ordered by the Word? The regulative principle itself isn't an easy thing to, to think about or to explain because, first of all, there are two major different and divergent understandings of what the regulative principle is and how it is to work. I mean, at the heart, it, everyone agrees. It means that worship is to be regulated by Scripture. Okay, good, good. I don't think you're going to find anyone who's going to deny that. You're just going to find a lot of people who disobey that. But they're two very divergent understandings, and, and you might summarize them as the Lutheran trajectory and the Reformed trajectory. The Lutheran trajectory establishes the regulative principle in a more negative way and the Calvinists in a more positive way. That is to say, a via negativa and a via positiva for those of you who can't leave the afternoon without some more Latin. <laughs> in the via negativa, in the Lutheran way, it means this. Anything not forbidden in Scripture is allowed. So it's a negative test. If Scripture doesn't forbid it, then it's allowed. And that's why the Lutheran's understanding of the sacraments are different than even the Reformed understanding of the sacraments. And if you see Lutheran, confessional, historic Lutherans at worship, they include things that the Calvinists would never have included. If you look at Luther and the Lutheran church and its calendar, you will notice they still have even Marian days of devotion and other, other days related to the saints and the rest. And, uh, and you'll, you'll, have, you'll have Lutheran churches with names that Calvinist churches would never have. And it's because if it's not forbidden in Scripture, according to the Lutheran tradition, the regulative principle, then, then it's allowable. But the Calvinist, the reform principle, was positive, which meant if it's not specifically authorized in Scripture, it is forbidden. Now, that's why you end up with, with, with very different approaches to worship. Just uh, this past weekend, I was speaking at a conference in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was speaking uh, that was held in a Presbyterian church. It was a, a, it sounded like a New England meeting house. It was stunningly beautiful. It had a high pulpit. One of those pulpits you have to go up steps into which you stand and from which you can hurt yourself if you fall. It's exactly the kind of pulpit there ought to be. It's, it, it's, it, it's a pulpit. It's hanging on the side of the wall. The thing's massive. And it's got a sounding board over it. It's exactly where you think Jonathan Edwards would preach. And, and you look in that room and the room says, this is about preaching. Deal with it. <laughs> and right across the street from the hotel was Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, which is built in 1766. That's 10 years before the revolution. And I walked in there, and oh, if you could only see that pulpit. It is Europe Baroque brought to America. It is a pulpit that is gilded and it is unbelievably ornate. You, you, you have to climb up into that one too and you can get hurt just standing in it. The thing is massive and it's got candles around it and angels looking at you and it's just, it's just absolutely incredible. And you look at that and, and not only that, but George Whitfield preached right there about three months before he died and you think, oh, this is history. It all comes together and then you realize there's the Calvinist tradition and the Lutheran tradition, and boy, are they different because the Calvinists would not have that pulpit and the Lutherans prize it. It's just different. Well, in terms of the Reformed tradition, once you affirm the fact that nothing is allowable that is not explicitly allowed in Scripture, that doesn't necessarily end as much as it begins a conversation. Because then the question is, what exactly is authorized in Scripture? How is it authorized? To what extent? What's the acceptable range within that authorization? Let me try to summarize something of what it would mean for Scripture positively to be regulated by Scripture. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. It would mean that the first understanding of worship begins with preaching and the ordinances. That before we know anything else about Scripture, we begin with exactly what Luther said were the first two marks of the church, where the word of God is rightly preached, and as I would prefer to say, when the ordinances are rightly obeyed. Now that immediately raises a question because in so many of our churches, the ordinances are, are mere appendages to worship or, or, or they're sometimes even severed from worship. But this is where we would understand that, that this is indeed, these are the acts that cry out the gospel. These are the visible acts of obedience by which people understand what the gospel is. In, in baptism, it is declared that we are 
buried with Christ and, and raised to walk a newness of life. It, it is baptism that is, is the reminder of what it means to obey Christ even as the Son obeyed the Father in baptism. It is a public act whereby confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is made clear. And the element of water is not something that was chosen by the apostles because it was convenient and universally available and clean but it was rather mandated by God himself in the scripture, even as the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the Samaritan woman told her that she should think not so much about water, but about the living water, which once received leads to everlasting life. And the Lord's table, the Lord's table, it cries out the atoning acts of the new covenant the acts of atonement accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ who established that ordinance as he was in that famous last meal with his own disciples and when he explained to them the, not only what would happen but the meaning of this happening in two elements of bread and, 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 and of wine that are not chosen arbitrarily but themselves as, as the bread and the fruit of the grape are there to demonstrate his body broken for us and his blood shed for us the bread and the cup a worship regulated by scripture defined positively would always include the public reading of scripture we certainly saw that in Nehemiah but we also see this in the instructions found in the New Testament you find the Apostle Paul saying to Timothy he's to pay heed to himself and and what is he to do even when he doesn't have yet the opportunity to preach he is to pay attention to prayer and to the public reading of scripture there's so little scripture read in so many evangelical worship services that it's not abundantly clear that it's understood that the public reading of scripture is supposed to happen Sometimes it happens, and mercifully, at least, it happens in terms of the reading of the text for preaching. But I hear preachers these days who increasingly don't even read the text they are preaching, which is a horrifying mistake at at every level. First of all, in whom do we have our trust? Our ability as a preacher or God's ability as a revealer? And if the authority is Scripture, we had sure better read it before we preach it. But in the public reading of Scripture, it would be anticipated throughout the history of the church that it wouldn't be merely the text that is preached, but a text that would call us to worship. And and a text that is read in order to situate God's people in order to hear even more Scripture. Prayer would be included, explicitly authorized and commanded in terms of Christian worship. And here we have models in the Old Testament and in the New of the kinds of prayers that would include, yes, a doxology, a, a, what we would even call an invocation. It would be a declaration in terms of the fact that we know why we are gathered here and whose we are and in, in whose name we are here gathered together. And, and we ask the Lord to bless us with his presence, not because we are worthy, but because we bear the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ and he will not deny his own son. And then, of course, Scripture mandates the prayer of confession. When we look to the pattern of worship that is found in Isaiah chapter 6, it, it, the, most, the most missing part of that pattern of worship in so many churches is where Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord the Lord of hosts. But you'll notice that even in Isaiah 6, the prayer of confession isn't what ends the passage. It's it's, it's not the prayer of confession, that's the end of the story. No, instead there's the reenactment and declaration of redemption as the seraphim go and two of them take the, the coals with tongs from the fire and bring it to Isaiah's lips and touch his lips and declare his redemption by the sheer unmerited grace and mercy of God and 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 that remission of sins that forgiveness and mercy of God is declared and where God's people are rightly gathered together in worship that is regulated by scripture there will be the glad relief that comes to Christ's own people when corporately They confess their sins and corporately, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Here the declaration of the forgiveness of sins by the sheer merits of Christ alone. Solus Christus. Where there is true worship, there will be singing. Now in the Old Testament, it's hard to come up with a systematic understanding of how song was to be incorporated in worship, but it's, it's really clear that it's there. And, and, and it's clear that especially in acts of worship, there is, there is gladsome music, there's mournful music. It's amazing in the Old Testament, the varieties of music that emerge, including what are described even in just the Psalms taken alone. The, the Psalter taken alone is an amazing range of music, not just of theological points and theological teachings and, and poetic structures and devices. It's an amazing musical, musical display of how low we can go in our sin and how majestic we can reach as we declare the glory of God. In the New Testament, we are told to encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's just wonderful, with, with psalms. By the way, we will never improve on the Psalter, period. Now, there's an argument here against Psalter only, unless you believe that the Psalter, the Psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs are exactly the same thing. I don't think you needed that entire trifold phrase for one thing. I do believe, however, there's the indictment here of the absence of the Psalms in so much of our singing. And, and then hymns and spiritual songs, you, you know enough of the interpretation of the New Testament and of that passage in Colossians to know we're not exactly sure exactly what's there. And when we speak of hymns, we're speaking of a specific hymnet structure that, was, that has developed in the tradition of the Christian church. And I would say not without good reason, that not without good reason. And then spiritual songs, and, and that spiritual songs would authorize all kinds of songs that are sung in worship. I'm not sure how to put all that together. I don't think anyone actually is. I think that's why the regulative principle of worship ordered by Scripture will, will be applied differently in different places. So long as the congregation is authentically and humbly under the authority of God's Word, and as those who are responsible for worship are seeking the good of Christ's people and faithfulness to the Word of God and declaration of the gospel in everything that they do. Okay, so I don't have this opportunity very often, so I'm going to ask you a question. I like so much of, of the new music. I really do. I'm not saying that because I'm supposed to say that. I say that because I sing it, and I go to a church intentionally that sings the old hymns and the new hymns. I just have a question, because I, and I, this, is a, this is a millennial thing, I think. So just, just understand, someone younger needs to explain this to someone older, but it does bother me, and I'm just, I've never raised this in public before, so here I am. Why, I wonder why millennials tend to take some of the most incredibly aggressively positive statements of scripture or of hymnody and put them in a minor key. I, I, I'm asking that seriously because I, 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 think, I think every generation has its own phenomenology and symptomology. And look, I ended up talking about this with John Piper one night. We were talking about one song and how horrible it was. And he simply interrupted and said, look, you and I were raised in a generation in which we sang, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. <laughs> and so <laughs> we got to be real careful about throwing stones. Uh, and so understand that. Um, the problem of my generation was we sang in a major key stuff that shouldn't have been sung at all. But, uh, <laughs> but it does raise the question, you know, are, are we in our song? Are we declaring? Because there are things, there are laments that need to be sung in a very minor key. And I, I mean, we need to be scraping the floor because that's where we are. But when we declare immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light and accessible, hid from our eyes, when we declare the gospel of Jesus Christ and his atoning acts and full acquittal from sin for sinners through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I feel constrained in a minor key. And I want Christ's people to understand we are rejoicing here. We are really, really happy right here. <laughs>
and it's okay to show it. We have been saved from our sins. We were dead, we're now alive. We were blind and now we see. This is happy time. Let's let it show. Yeah, that's an editorial comment, do with it what you will. And then also in terms of a worship regulated by scripture, there has to be a call for response. And, and by that, I do not mean an altar call. I'm not saying it doesn't mean that. I'm, I'm just saying there has to be a call for response. There has to be a what now for Christ's people. You can't just leave and say that was the word of God, take it or leave it. You can't say this is the word of God, let's sing a song to make sure we all know it. We're going to have to bear it this week. We, we need somehow to say, the word of God has declared this. Do we believe it? The gospel has been declared. Have Christ's people heard it? And are there sinners who hear it and need to profess with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead? One way or another, there has to be some way of telling every single hearer, you're going to leave here responding. Let's act like we know it. And of course, benediction. That is not an accident either. What's a benediction? It's not just the opposite of the invocation. It's not just the, so it's not like Ferris Bueller's day off where at the end of the credits, he comes out and says, you can go home now. That dates me. Is that too old? <laughs> All right. Some of you need to do a little research tonight. Um, in any event, in any event, there's blessing at the end of worship. It's God's blessing we have received, but you know, that's where a lot of Protestants get it wrong. The benediction is not just about God blessing us. Christ's people should not leave without brothers and sisters in Christ blessing each other in Christ. Then what is not allowable? Seven points. Trust me, they're quick. Seven points. Number one, anything that draws attention to the self. That's not allowable in Scripture. Scripture would regulate it in such a way that it is not about the worshiper, but the one who is worshipped. And anything that draws attention to the self is itself overruled by Scripture. Secondly, anything that minimizes truth for the sake of feeling. If we find ourselves trying to orchestrate feeling at the expense of truth, then we've got a big problem. Third, anything contrary to Scripture, period. We understand that, but that actually means we have to know what Scripture says. It's impossible for Scripture to regulate worship in a people who don't know what the Scripture says. Fourth, anything speculative or questionable. In other words, if you have a question about it, just don't do it. Do, do you ever in, in worship have those moments when you realize, I just heard that for the first time. I don't think I believe that. Happened to me in this room. I was, I was in this room. I'm president of the institution. I'm in charge of this. And uh, this was years ago. There's no one here who's guilty of this now. They're all gone. <laughs> but uh, we, were <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were in worship. And, and I, I know this is somebody's favorite song. If you wrote this song, I do not mean offense. Although I think you have to be very old. But it was uh, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. It's really good. There's a lot of it's really good. And until the I can feel the rush or brush of angels' wings, I see glory in his face. I can remember singing that thinking, I, didn't, I haven't felt that. <laughs> I don't believe that. I just bore false testimony. I have, and if I ever did feel the rush of angels' wings, I would not be sitting here singing, you know, kumbaya, I feel the rush of angels' wings. I'd be wetting my pants running out of the room. Uh, that is not... <laughs> that, I mean, read the scripture. When angels show up, what do they have to say? Don't die. We're bringing you good tidings of great joy. <laughs> you know, if you hear yourself singing something and you say, that just doesn't sound right, then don't sing it. There's so much that you know to sing with energy and, 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 and with volume and with joy because it's so right. Five, anything that disguises Christian worship. 
I, I honestly think there are many people gathered together for worship who want an outsider who walked in never to guess that's what they're doing. This looks like just anything else. Don't stop. No accident here. Nothing to see here. This is just what goes on everywhere else. This isn't what goes on everywhere else. You're talking about breaking that which demonstrates the body of Christ. You are talking about spilling liquid that points to the shed blood of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. This isn't what's going on everywhere else. Six, anything that confuses the gospel. Anything that doesn't speak rightfully of the gospel, anything that distracts people from the gospel or, or leads them to wonder what the gospel really is, just leave it. And lastly, anything that distracts from the glory of God. At the end of the day, what scripture would have us to do is to measure everything we say, everything we sing, everything we do in worship by whether or not it is God who receives the glory. We wanna squeeze every decision insofar as the Lord's wisdom will come to us by scripture in order to make certain that he not only receives glory, but the maximum glory from everything we do. We want songs that demonstrate and display to the maximum God's glory. We, we, we want to, to sing songs that display the gospel to the max. We, we, we want to order our lives in terms of the ordinances so that to the maximum they demonstrate what they teach and what they show of the character of God and the newness of life in the gospel and the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. And we want to do everything we can to show the fellowship of the saints in the people blessed by the preaching and by the worship of God. We want to show the joy in song and get everything out of every song and every word and every note. And then we want to bless those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ to the maximum. And then we want to go out to the world as Christ's people who are going to need that authentic worship ruled by Scripture until we can crawl our way back a week later in order to do it again, in order to live. And we need to show the joy of Christ to a world that is trying to figure out if there is any good news. And we've got the only good news that there is. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for all you have given us in Scripture and in Scripture alone. May we be a scriptured people and may it be never more abundantly clear than in our worship. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.